Hey everybody. This is my 125 gallon native tank and I'm getting ready to do a simple water change on it. I'm going to get in there and wipe down the glass. I might work on the filter, you know, do a simple filter cleaning and all that, but I'm not going to make a big deal out of this video. I got a bunch of stuff I'm trying to get done today and I'm probably going to wind up shooting quite a few videos by the end of it. So this one is just going to be a simple before and after. If we look real close here for a minute, I don't have the forward light fixture turned on, but you can see some algae growing on the glass here. Let me hit this fixture for a moment. Get it into position. So with the forward fixture on, it makes the tank look a lot different. You really get to see the colors in the fish and everything. And I usually put that light on when I'm filming. But occasionally I will leave it on and it only takes a day or so before I've got algae growing across the front glass here. And I'm going to get in and wipe that down. So here you go. This is again just going to be a simple before and after. So there's your before look. Alright everybody, I didn't plan on doing any video while I was in the middle of this water change. But you know what? When I got into this filter, it's just so disgusting inside. I thought I would share it with everybody. Uh, I always say that I don't really... Uh, actually, you know what? Let me turn this forward light off here. That's probably the one that's glaring on us so badly. Or not. Well, we're just going to have to see as it comes out. See, it's not the water's barely even running through and draining back out. Uh, I didn't put my little plastic mat underneath it here, which I really probably should have, because this is going to be nasty by the time I'm done. And there we go. We're starting to see our first evidence of ultraviolet radiation damage. So I'm going to have to start making uh, some repair work on this filter as well. I've already shot some video on that in the past. I'll definitely do some more video when I work on this filter, but that's not going to be today. Oh, this is just so gross. We haven't even gotten to the actual filter tray yet. That water barely runs through there. So we've got extremely reduced water flow going through this filter right now. So this was way overdue for a water change. That's just gross. So I guess we may as well have a look uh, over as I'm putting the filter back together. And we'll take a look at how I do that. So sit tight. Give me a minute and I'll see you over at my workstation. Alright, so let's see what we got. That is just about disgusting. I keep a metal rack in here so I can throw stuff like that on it and it allows it to drip and drain. I'm now going to switch this over and use this as the top piece since we just saw that we're getting damage to the lower portions. Again, this will be the second from the bottom. And you can see how it's pretty gross. So we're going to just rinse a little bit of this out. Remember, you don't want to rinse this too thoroughly because this is, that gunk is a lot of your nitrifying bacteria. I also want to remind you that I have well water, so I do not have any chlorine or chloramine or anything in my water. Uh, do not do this if you have municipal water that does have chlorine or chloramine in it. You'll kill off way too much of your nitrifying bacteria. But you do want to rinse it thoroughly enough that the water is able to free flow through it. You don't want it being clogged up or slowing the water flow down. Uh, not only does that reduce the efficiency of your uh, aeration and your water flow, but it's the, the less water flowing through there, the less contact it has with the nitrifying bacteria. So it's, it's inefficient in more ways than one. So here we begin to see the damage from the UV. I guess that's coming out on camera. You can even see where the plastic material is beginning to break down. So 
I know everybody always says you shouldn't run the UV all the time. I don't have any choice in this filter. This filter is the model 404B, not the 304B. And in the model 404B, you cannot turn the, the bio light off, or the, the UV light. You can't turn it off, there's no switch. The only thing I could do is now that I've got it apart, I could take the bulb out and just take the tube out completely. And if I needed to use it again, I could reinstall it and it would be on again. I'm not gonna do that. I actually prefer to have it run all the time anyway. So we're just gonna alter this one temporarily. As I said, we're gonna swap those bottom trays that haven't been damaged yet. And we're gonna put them on the top trays. Uh, I get about a year before I start getting that damage, maybe a little less than a year. So that gives me time to work on this and get it sorted out. But you can see all of the deterioration that's occurring from the ultraviolet light. And these feel really thick and clogged and heavy. So these are definitely in need of a good rinse. Let the water flow through them more thoroughly. And yes, these are just plastic scrubby sponges you can get at your dollar store, six for a dollar. Make sure you do not buy the kind that have any kind of soap pre-added or anything like that if you're going to be using them. I would hope to think that's pretty obvious, but you never know. It's worth mentioning. All right, uh, so now the way we're going to put this back together is the first trays that go in will be the trays that uh, ultimately are on the top. So these two damaged trays are going to be the last trays we put in here, and therefore they'll be the first trays to go back in the filter, and these damaged sections will be below where the ultraviolet light is. And while the water flow will be disrupted somewhat and the filter will be a little bit less efficient, uh, it won't be terrible. And again, that'll give me time to start working on repairing them because I do have some other trays that are sitting around somewhere and all I need to do is fix them. And then the next water change I do, I'll be able to go ahead and use these trays. So all I do is take some of this batting. Uh, first, we're gonna fill the bottom tray, the actual filtration tray. And in this case, we're not gonna put a ton in here because a lot of the water is not really gonna be getting down here uh, the way it should. All right, sorry for that abrupt uh, cut there, but my little baby kitten got underfoot and I stepped on her back paw and she screamed and so I'm not sure where I had to cut the film uh, But we had to cut all that stuff out So I think where I left off was that we were talking about filling this bottom tray Which is going to be the actual filtering tray that's got all of the uh, Filter material in it and I was just about to explain that what I use for filter material is simple uh, polyfill I use the thick the extra loft it's just called batting. It comes in big rolls. I've already cut it into sheets, um, but it's 90 by 108 inches. And if you cut this into normal size pads for like a hang on the back filter, you can get more, more than 100, depending on the size you need, more than 200 if you need smaller ones, uh, for about $10. It's really versatile. You can cut it. You can tear it into pieces, which I've just done here, uh, fold it up and stuff it into different places just to make sure it gets where you want it. It's good stuff. There might be um, some products out there that have been treated with a fire retardant material, something like that. I've never come across that. I've never noticed it, but I suppose that is worth looking for. Everything I ever just see says batting, and there's nothing on there about it being uh, sprayed with anything or treated with any kind of chemicals. It's, it's literally just woven polyester. So perfectly safe to use in your aquarium, provided you do not use anything that's been treated with uh, a fire retardant or anything. So this one I am going to cut. And now we're up to where we are just using a sheet or two for a liner. And then the biomaterial is going to start going in here. 
and it doesn't really matter what you put where I just put it in however it happens to fit it just houses some bacteria honestly I don't know why um, I've always used bio rings and bio balls and used them in combination and I honestly don't know why I don't know what the purpose or benefit of doing it that way is supposed to be you could stack the whole tray full of these you could stack the whole tray full of rings it just doesn't matter as long as you've got biomaterial in there you're you're fine and when I say biomaterial see here you can just tear this a little bit to get it to go around where you need it to uh, when I say biomaterial I'm talking about um, physical material like this that is designed to give surface area to your nitrifying bacteria. This allows the nitrifying bacteria uh, a place to call home basically and it grows on the surface of these sponges so you want stuff like sponges. Um, I know it's hard to tell by looking at it but this ceramic is really porous material so on a microbial level, on a microscopic level there's a lot of surface area on ceramic rings and that's why they're commonly used. Uh, anything that provides lots and lots of surface area, sponges, scrubbies, anything like that uh, works well for biomaterial provided it hasn't been treated with anything and so on and so forth. You want to use inert material, um, you don't want to use any kind of material that's going to dissolve into the water like a crushed coral or something like that. That would obviously be altering your water chemistry rather than simply providing surface area. So I guess I could have spread some of these sponges out. I didn't have to pack them in so tightly in some of these lower trays, which again is something to consider. The water has to flow through this stuff in order to be effective. So you don't want to pack stuff in there so tightly that the water won't flow either. So the tank's been draining all this time. Let's get back to it. And we're going to go ahead and put the filter back together and shoot the before and after real quick. So I'll see you over there. And here's your after. So this is immediately after. Normally when I do a before and after video, I always let the tank settle down, all the bubbles get out of it. Of course this tank has bubbles being produced in it, so they'll never get out of it completely. Um, but I usually use a little bit of hydrogen peroxide in there and I usually do some other things and it gets everything stirred up. And if you keep fish yourself, you'll know that immediately after a water change, the tank really doesn't look all that lovely. Uh, it takes a while for all that sort of stirred up debris and everything to settle back down. Today, however, I've got a lot on my plate. I just want to get this done so I don't have a video that I've got to finish shooting later this evening pending uh, or anything else. But I wanted to point out a couple of points of interest. And one of those was going to be how these are cold water fish. These are native fish and being that they're cold water fish, I've explained before, does not mean they can they need to be in cold water, but sudden changes in water temperature don't affect them and they don't need to stay in warm water. When I had a native tank before and it was in a 40 gallon tank, when I would do a water change, I wouldn't run any warm water at all. I would just turn the tap on cold and fill the tank back up. And I was doing massive water changes at the time. Uh, I'm not recommending this. This was back when I had much less experience. I was doing 75% water changes and not adjusting the temperature. And I would drop the tank temperature so drastically that the tank would quite literally sweat. You know, the, the condensation would form on my tank, you know, down here in my warm, humid basement. I would get the tank that chilly because, remember, I have a well. And after the water's been running for a few minutes, it's groundwater, so it's cold water. And I would shift them from upper 70s to probably, you know, mid-60s in one water change in a few minutes. And it never bothered the fish at all. I never saw anything, that, you know, that showed any signs of bother. So today... I didn't quite do that because I have fish in this tank that are not cold water fish, namely these two right here. And if you look at how strange my Mayan cichlid looks, he is kind of the point of all this. I took the temperature of the tank after I did the water change and it the temperature had dropped about 3 degrees. It was it was about 77 degrees instead of the normal 80-ish that it that it usually sits around. So when I did the water change, I didn't run straight cold water into the tank. I just put a little bit of hot water in it just to sort of take the edge off the chili. But it was cool water running into the tank 
And of course you've got this huge volume of water and you've got all these stones and everything in here that are holding a lot of that energy. So you'd, you'd have to really shift the temperature pretty hard in order to have a, a, a significant overall impact on changing your temperature. Um, the water temperature being five or 10 degrees different really isn't gonna make that big of a difference. But I did shift it three full degrees. And I started looking around and I noticed that, of course, everybody's always laying low after a water change. You can see how everybody's all hiding down here and the crayfish have all gone to ground. It's just been a busy day for everybody and they haven't settled down yet. It's again, five to 10 minutes after we just finished putting the hoses away. And this Mayan cichlid seems absolutely stunned. I've never noticed this before. This could happen every time I do a water change. I do them the same way all the time, so this isn't like I was experimenting with seeing if he could stand a temperature change or anything. But he's actually starting to move around now. Uh, for the first several minutes, he was so docile, it was almost like he had literally been stunned. And I, I tried waving my hands around in front of him, and he just he wasn't moving. His, his uh, respiration was odd, and the colors definitely look stressed his colors don't look right at all so i don't know if it was just the shock of all of the water change and me getting in there and you know grubbing around and wiping the glass down and everything he might look like this after every water change i've never paid that much attention it was only because i was shooting this video specifically i wanted to you know know what i was talking about when i shot a video about how the fish in this tank reacted to a small temperature change and this was the only thing of note so is it because of the temperature change or not i don't know but now that i'm aware of it i'm going to pay attention to it in the future uh, and as i always say whenever i find anything that i find interesting i always like to get that on video just i just assume if i find it interesting somebody else might too so i'll keep my eye on him and i'll see what happens as the uh day progresses as i said i've got a lot on my mind and one of those things i think is going to be going and catching some small crayfish to go in this tank so make sure you're subscribed and you won't miss that uh, i will shoot some video when we go to catch the crayfish probably and of course at the very least i'll be shooting video of when we release them into the tank here so make sure you're subscribed and you won't miss any of that thanks again for watching don't forget this is my native tank see you real soon in the next one